Hello and welcome everyone to this week's uh, Infosys Chandrasekhar and Random Geometry Colloquium. Today we are extremely glad to have our Professor Anish Ghosh as a speaker who will give us a talk on inhomogeneous quadratic forms. Over to you. Thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. So it's a pleasure to speak in this series, especially on the auspicious occasion of Valentine's Day. Uh, so this is the best way to spend the Valentine's Day as far as I'm concerned. So, <laughs> and it looks like at least some of you agree with me. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about a class of objects called inhomogeneous quadratic forms. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, motivate uh, why one should study them and uh, explain a little bit of progress that we've been able to manage to make in the last few years in their study. So the story uh, actually, as far as these quadratic forms are concerned, begins with a um, uh, conjecture in physics. So uh, it's, uh, so I, I say that this is a very clever conjecture and I put conjecture in quotes and that is not at all meant to be uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just a fact that it's kind of wrong some of the times, but uh, it's very uh, it's plausible and proved in some other cases. So this has to do with um, eigenvalues. Could, of, could you uh, move to the closer to the mic or something? The, okay, sure. Sound is somewhat... Uh, okay. Thanks. So uh, this is uh, something that has to do with uh, uh, somehow uh, statistics of eigenvalues of the Laplacian on uh, in, in uh, you know, for example, like the geodesic flow or the flat two torus. Right? So the conjecture as such states that uh, the statistics of the eigenvalues uh, uh, display a high level of independence. Okay, so uh, for uh, what this means more concretely is uh, if you uh, consider The following setup. So you take a sequence of uh, numbers, lambda one, lambda two, uh, positive numbers going to infinity. And these are, are going to be the values taken by a certain uh, quadratic form. So uh, this is a form which has, is uh, m minus alpha squared plus n minus beta squared. So alpha and beta are uh, fixed real numbers and m and n vary uh, uh, across the integer lattice in uh, R2. Okay, so uh, it's a very simple thing. I just uh, consider this expression and record its values, and that's all. So, so it turns out actually that uh, this expression, this n minus alpha squared plus n minus beta squared, can be viewed. Uh, so, the sequence of uh, values of this uh, quadratic form can be viewed uh, up to some scaling as uh, eigenvalues of uh, Laplacian with some. Uh, Quasi periodicity conditions on the flat two torus. Okay, so this corresponds to like the classical uh, geodesic flow on the unit tangent bundle of the flat two torus. And the very clever conjecture uh, makes various uh, predictions about uh, the distribution of uh, the sequence of lambda i's. And uh, basically, this kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, independence of uh, the distribution of eigenvalues in uh, integrable systems. There's a very uh, general theme in this kind of uh, quantum chaos, uh, system, quantum chaotic systems. But it seems to be um, something which is very, very hard to rigorously verify. Okay, so very little seems to be known. And uh, so one of the uh, kind of outstanding results in this direction is, uh, uh, has to do with what is called the pair correlation density. So this is kind of uh, one step down from uh, what Barry and Tibor wanted, which is some kind of Poissonian distribution of eigenvalues. That's too uh, hard to, it seems to be out of reach. So uh, one uh, kind of, uh, uh, takes baby steps, and one important step is to consider the pair correlation density of these eigenvalues. So what you do is 
you consider a, a sequence of real numbers of mean density d, which just means what is written over here, and look at uh, their pair correlation. So what this is, is a function uh, called R2. It depends on an interval a, b, and a parameter lambda. And it's the suitably normalized number of eigenvalues which are less than or equal to lambda and whose difference lies in the interval a b okay and so now uh, the question is uh, what can you say about this uh, function uh, can you say anything at all okay so um so this was uh, actually proved in a very beautiful paper by jens markloff and the theorem says that if uh, you uh, pick the alpha and beta carefully, namely if they are algebraically independent over the rational numbers, and further, if uh, the number alpha is supposed to be diophantine, it assumed to be diophantine. This is a condition which uh, essentially. What is alpha beta here? So alpha and beta. I'm sorry, let me just scroll back a little. Are the two fixed factors in this quadratic form up here? M minus alpha squared plus N minus okay. beta. So the same one. Oh, thanks. Okay, so the lambda i's are recording values of this quadratic form as M and N vary over the integers. You're just writing everything down. And then you want to find some uh, nice pattern in this list of numbers that you've written down. And the way we are trying to do that is to consider the pair correlation. So you're fixing alpha and beta and varying m and n, right? That's, that's what right. You're that's right. right. Oh, thank you. And uh, the, the, this, uh, yeah, the, the pair correlation that you mentioned, that's basically asking for the statistics of the difference between lambda i, lambda j, or lambda j, lambda k lying in a minus b yes. or in the interval a, b after normalization. Is that that's right? That's right. Oh. So it's, it's one statistic for the lambda. And, you know, people have recently taken to taking a triple correlation and things like that. So essentially uh, proving that, uh, you know, finding good systems, finding good, interesting systems where the full force of the very time conjecture is true seems to be uh, kind of out of reach. And so what one does instead is look at, uh, you know, um, classical dynamic consistent like the Dirac flow or the torus, and try to find sort of less ambitious uh, statistical properties of that. So already this is a, a kind of very difficult thing to do, and uh, Markov group is uh, following a very impressive result, which, as far as I know, was the first rigorous. Uh, verification of the very type of conjecture for first deterministic and rigorous verification. So it proved that the, as the lambda goes to infinity, this pair correlation function indeed converges to what you would expect, which is pi times uh, b minus a, because uh, you know the uh, by Weyl's law and by the normalization over here, pi is the correct constant to come out. So this was a kind of a very impressive result. And the main input here was actually something coming from a very different subject. It was Ratner's theorem. Okay, so Markov somehow managed to convert this pair correlation problem into a problem in homogeneous dynamics using as a vehicle something called theta sarna. Earlier, a few years before this, Sarnak had proved that the Bray double conjecture was true for almost all flat tor. Okay, so, this is an important uh, thing here for us because it's uh, indicative of the fact that uh, sometimes if you're unable to prove a deterministic result in an arithmetic situation, then perhaps you might want to consider proving it uh, for a random system, for a generic system. So this is one of the main themes today, as far as we're concerned. 
So subsequent to his breakthrough over here, Markla also treated the case of the end torus. Yeah, so uh, this question, I mean, this uh, Sarnak, so the, the excluded thing, is it uh, something that you can uh, sort of identify that, look, if it is away from such and such locus in, uh, say, the modelized space of all n tori, then uh, this is true, or is it, uh, I mean, a, a more probabilistic result? So as far as I know, it's based on an application uh, of a very clever application of the Borel Cantilever. And so it's uh, most, uh, as far as I know, it can't identify the exceptional data. Ah, uh, I see, I see. So, and, and Martlov's thing is for all, all flat tori, is that? The it's for all, uh, it's this, this, this result, they translated back into the thing, is only for the torus, uh, only for the lattice Z2. Uh -huh. It's, oh, only for, it's only for R2 uh -huh. mod Z2. I'll come to the more general case in a couple of slides. Okay. So by flat torus, you mean two-dimensional flat torus? Two-dimensional flat torus, that's right. Uh -huh. It's just for R2 mod Z2 only. And uh, the case where you uh, consider other lattices in R2, other tori will come up just in a couple of slides. So it translates into a slightly different uh, arithmetic problem, which is that. Is that okay? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is uh, basically the kind of uh, aperitif as it were. So um, we want to uh, study objects like this uh, inhomogeneous quadratic form. So this uh, expression n minus alpha plus n minus beta is an example of an inhomogeneous quadratic form. And uh, the diaphanetine conditions in Markov's theorem make the form a so-called irrational form, okay? So a precise definition will come up shortly. And the very table conjecture for flat tori therefore amounts to studying the values at integer points of irrational inhomogeneous quadratic forms. Okay, so this uh, conjecture in quantum chaos amounts to a purely arithmetic problem. Can you say something intelligent about the values? taken by a certain specific class of quadratic forms at integer points. So uh, unsurprisingly, this is a kind of a popular subject in many communities. So this has uh, attracted a lot of attention, including the recent breakthroughs of uh, Blomer, Burgan, Radzivil, and Rudnick, as well as Blomer and Radzivil. So this series of works uh, considers what I was uh, saying earlier, uh, the triple correlation function, which is one more, um, some more information. And so uh, today what I want to do is I want to kind of um, ask, okay, so this is an example of some inhomogeneous quadratic form. Can you say something general about the uh, quantitative arithmetic of these objects or not. Okay, so if so, what can you say and what are the tools that are involved? So this turns out to be, uh, at least for me, a surprisingly delicate matter. And so uh, today I want to kind of present some results that I obtained along with my co-authors recently. These, there seem to be, um, as of now, three ways of uh, approaching this kind of problem. So one thing is that uh, we want to go beyond Ratner's theorem. Because Ratner's theorem uh, does not allow us to make uh, quantitative statements. I'll explain what that is soon. And we are interested in making quantitative statements. So Ratner's theorem in its, uh, you know, in, in its form is not suitable for us. So we need a new uh, bag of tools. And so there are going to be three different uh, toolkits. 
for us today. Uh, one of them is going to be uh, higher moments for certain functions on homogeneous spaces. So these functions are uh, commonly called Eisenstein series. The second tool is a purely analytic kind of approach using exponential sums and the circle method. And the third tool, which is the focus of today's talk, is a more ergodic approach and uh, heavily depends on the harmonic analysis of sense and groups and spectral theory. So today, uh, my plan is to introduce a quantitative problem for inhomogeneous quadratic forms and try to state some results and then try to give a feeling for the spectral approach to this problem. So as I said, uh, deterministic results, uh, results which pinpoint a specific kind of quadratic form and so on are really quite rare. And even random results like the result of Sarna seem to be quite challenging uh, in the problem that we are going to set. Okay, so uh, let's uh, define uh, things a little more generally now. So, let me consider a non-degenerate quadratic form on Rn. So non-degenerate just means that it's, uh, you know, you can't uh, reduce it to a quadratic form in a fewer number of variables. So I'm given such a quadratic form and a fixed vector alpha. And given the, these two pieces of information, I can manufacture like we did before an inhomogeneous form, which is just a shifted version of this quadratic form, okay? And as, as we saw before, the form in the berry tabor conjecture had irrational coefficients. So let's define an uh, inhomogeneous quadratic form to be irrational if one of two things happens. Either the quadratic form itself is not proportional to a quadratic form with integer coefficients. That's one possibility. The second possibility is that the shift is an irrational vector. If either of these conditions is satisfied, we shall refer to our inhomogeneous quadratic form as an irrational quadratic form, okay? And the philosophy or the guiding principle or problem uh, for us, uh, you know, following from this uh, very type of business is uh, I want to kind of uh, learn as much as possible about the values taken by these forms at integer points. Okay, so this is the main consideration. To Okay, so maybe I can uh, now state a very nice theorem of um, Margulis and uh, Mohammadi. And so they considered uh, the very natural question of uh, counting uh, how many uh, integer vectors are there in a large ball so that uh, the quadratic form takes uh, values in some specific interval, okay? So I take a large uh, ball around the origin and look at all the integer vectors in this ball and feed them into the quadratic form, feed them into the inhomogeneous form and demand that uh, the quadratic form take values in a specified interval r, okay? So then the question is, this is a nice counting function can you uh, give a formula for it? Can you say something about its growth and so on? So, you know, for people who have uh, maybe seen uh, problems in arithmetic geometry, uh, as some, some of a central problem in arithmetic geometry is uh, counting integral and rational points on varieties of bounded height, right? So this is this whole, uh, a program of Manning's to, um, which has produced some very beautiful work. And so this whole, uh, this uh, Berita-Gold philosophy, as well as this 
So the ergodic quadratic form philosophy is very similar, except that it counts uh, lattice points near curves, not on where near varieties, not on them. This is a counting function, which is counting in a certain sense lattice points in a Euclidean ball. So this is the bounded height, which lie near uh, variety. And so they proved a beautiful result, Marbles and Marbley. It says that under certain conditions, you can in fact find an asymptotic uh, expression for this counting function, namely up to a constant depending on the quadratic form, it's uh, t to the n minus two times the length of this interval. And uh, this is the right expression because uh, t to the n minus two times the volume of this interval is the volume of this region. Okay, so it's if you, uh, if I instead looked at the measure of vectors in Rn, which satisfy this condition, and we're in the ball of radius e, I would get an expression which is asymptotically key to the n minus two. So what their theorem says is that this counting function has a nice expression, and underlying that is uh, the fact that. Uh, the values taken by the quadratic form, by this inhomogeneous quadratic form, tends to be uh, equidistributed in some sense. Okay, there is some subtlety here, uh, namely that uh, in five and more variables you can actually get a limiting expression, whereas in uh, three and four the story is a bit more complicated. This is a beautiful result of Marbles and Normally. And of course, uh, you might ask, okay, so you're talking continuously about inhomogeneous quadratic forms. Surely uh, there must be some good literature on homogeneous quadratic forms. And of course there okay. is. Um, I'm just uh, kind of suppressing it just because, uh, you know, when I give talks and start with the whole history, I never make it to the end. So I just uh, say a few words that Margulis and Mar uh, I think there is a question probably. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Arish, uh, so, so yes. what? Can you say a word about where that n minus two comes from? Oh, so the n minus two is uh, basically, mm, so see, the thing is that if you take, if you look at the number of lattice points, uh, you know, in the classic, classic Gauss circle point problem, the number of lattice points in the ball of radius t, t large, then this is supposed to be like t to the n. Okay. And the quadratic okay. form is a degree two polynomial. Yeah. And it's going to uh, take all the t to the n points and push them into an oh, interval. Okay, okay. And so yeah. if they're equally spaced, you would expect them to be roughly t to the n minus. Okay. No, I was basically asking for the intuition behind the the the, the mixing, um, and and so so the basically all the points are equally distributed is the intuition. That's that's what you are saying. Yes, right? that's right. That's right. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. So actually, the uh, the, the the homogeneous part, maybe the part where alpha is zero, has a very illustrious history beginning with. Uh, uh, conjecture called Oppenheim's conjecture, uh, a beautiful observation of Raghunathan, a proof of Margulis of Oppenheim's conjecture, and quantitative versions. So, uh, since uh, we are mainly discussing these inhomogeneous forms, I didn't uh, get into the history, but it's really worth mentioning that this particular counting result has a kind of spectacular, uh, you know, predecessors. Uh, namely a, a landmark work of Dani Margulis and two landmark works of Eskin Margulis and Moses, which established this, this result with alpha equal to zero. Okay. Now Margulis and Mohamedi, when they proved this uh, uh, counting result for inhomogeneous forms, as a counter, uh, as a corollary, they get exactly what 
Mahan was asking. So they generalize Martloff's result, namely they get the very Tabor conjecture for other Torahs, so lattices other than Z, uh, which was and not so possible. Okay, so I also have a question. This S K modulus Moses, does it fail in lower dimension like three and four? So for three and four, um, that's why there are two papers. That's a good question. Let me explain it. The lower bound, which is due to Dani Margulis, is uniform in three and more variables. There's no problem. The upper bound does not work in. Uh, is not uniform. So there are two papers. Uh, the first paper uh, does the five or more. And then for signatures two, one, and two, two, the asymptotic actually is not correct. It's off by a logarithmic factor. So it's a more complicated situation. And this complication also, uh, in fact, comes from quantum chaos in some sense. So the second paper of Eskin Margulis and Moses is devoted only to two one and two. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the the, the, the upshot is that the lower bound works uh, in three and more variables, and the upper bound uh, works in all variables, but in three and four variables, it's uh, different than from five. Okay, so this is uh, some beautiful work on Margulis and Mahmoudi. And so now the kind of question that I'm interested in is, uh, here's a nice formula which they proved for this counting function, uh, but it's only a main term. Is it possible, for example, to prove error terms in this situation and uh, related questions? Okay, so here are two related questions. So this is this goes by the name uh, of effectivity in the dynamics community. So a consequence of uh, Margulis Mahamadi is that whenever you have an irrational quadratic form, you know, which is quadratic form such as this, the set of values it takes on Zn is a dense subset of R. And so now the question uh, that we want to ask today is, uh, can you make the density effective? So uh, I mean, the philosophical question is really very simple. So here they have this counting function where they count some so integer solutions to some inequalities and get a asymptotic formula. How am I supposed to find the solution? Right? Can you can you write down an algorithm? Can you find it? Can you at least provide some bounds about it? And uh, this is the uh, what we are mainly concerned with today. And uh, the, this is somehow uh, one of the main issues in dynamics today, which is that uh, the more, I mean, a very, very powerful tool uh, which underpins all of this is the work of uh, Dani, Mergulis, and Ratner on unipotent flows. And essentially, all of that becomes instantly unavailable because it's really uh, quite, it's impossible to derive something effective from it uh, immediately and to make it effective seems to be a very challenging prospect, which is now an ongoing kind of, uh, one of the main ongoing things in that analysis. So uh, how can we make this density effective? In other words, According to Margulis and Mohammadi, if you give me a real number C and uh, epsilon positive, I can produce for you an integer vector X solving this inequality here. And the question is, can you give a good bound for X? Okay, where should I look for it? The related question is, can you get good error terms in the solution count for uh, Margulis and Mormonis theorem. Okay, so this is the kind of, uh, this is the question that we want to address today. And it's sort of, uh, 
at some level, it's it's a very basic question. It's just it's just a polynomial in two variables, and you're just plugging in integers, and somehow it still seems to be a big struggle. So anyway, there's some good news. We can prove some small results. So let me try to set up the results. So uh, one, unfortunately, I can't report uh, any uh, deterministic results today. So my results, uh, because uh, of the fact that I belong to the random geometry group, tend to be mainly random. So I'm going to present only random results today, uh, but I still think they're quite interesting and uh, hope to convince you too. So how to make sense of randomness in the context of quadratic forms? And uh, what we can do is, you know, the space of quadratic forms itself is a nice uh, variety. And so um, one can make sense of almost every quadratic form uh, relatively easily. And uh, so it's a nice homogeneous space. If you fix some parameters, the space of quadratic forms of given parameters forms a nice homogeneous space of a uh, Lie group. And so there is a nice canonical measure on this object. So one can make sense of almost every quadratic form. And one can also make sense of almost every shift. So there are several regimes one can uh, look into while defining a generic or random quadratic form. One could vary the homogeneous part as well as the shift or fix one and vary the other. Okay, so there are three possible things one can do. There's a fourth possibility, uh, which I will talk about briefly, which is instead of averaging over all the quadratic forms to average over a sub variety of quadratic forms. This is a more challenging thing. I will discuss this briefly as well. So uh, we want to get uh, good uh, effective results for quadratic forms because uh, of the fact that Rackness theorems are not effective it is uh, out of reach now to get good effective bounds deterministic. There are one or two cases which are known, but the bounds are poor. Since we are making a kind of uh, a sacrifice by moving from deterministic to random, uh, one has to expect more. So if you want to look at random forms, you should try to give uh, as good a bound as possible. So that's our focus today, how to give the best possible bounds for generic inhomogeneous quadratic form. So the first, uh, first kind of regime where both Q and alpha vary is something that it's not clear how to do it, but it's well known. So I'll come to that later. First, I'm going to consider the case where I fix a shift, which is a rational vector, and allow the quadratic form to vary. So this is a joint work with my, <coughs> excuse me, collaborators are Duby Kelmer of Boston College and Shu Cheng Yu of uh, Uppsala University. And it's a kind of complicated uh, statement. So let me distill it for you. This says that if you fix a rational vector as a shift, then for almost every non degenerate indefinite quadratic form, you can get a good error term. So you can get a good error term for the counting function considered by Merkulis and Bond. Okay. As you'll see, it's the same main term that they have plus an error term with the power saving. And this error term with the power saving implies an answer to the effectivity question that we raised in the previous slide. It says in particular that for any kappa less than n minus 2, n is the number of variables. For every fixed shift, 
rational. And for almost every quadratic form, you have a solution to this system of inequalities. So uh, this, as I explained before, since we are making some small sacrifice by proving something which is true for almost every quadratic form, uh, we really want the best result. And this n minus two essentially is the best possible you can hope for. Okay, so this says that for a fixed shift, uh, a fixed rational shift in almost every quadratic form, uh, this is you get a satisfactory answer to this effective equation. Okay, so there is a second result which I won't dwell upon much. It's it's a result that says what what if your fixed shift is not a rational vector? Then the technique used over here kind of goes for a toss for a reason that I'll briefly explain. So what one has to do is one has to employ some kind of approximation process to approximate this vector by rational vectors and try to control the errors. And so you get a result, but it's weaker than the previous one. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, this would, I would say this, this should be considered to be an open problem. So this is a not satisfactory situation. Okay. A more interesting situation uh, occurs when uh, you fix the a rational quadratic form and let the shift vary. So here uh, is a, a theorem. Uh, again, this is joint work with Tubi Kelmer and Shu Cheng Liu. And it says that for any rational indefinite quadratic form and almost every shift, we can solve this system of inequalities. Now here is an interesting uh, twist. So last time I uh, spent some time boasting about how n minus two here is really the best possible thing. Over here, I'm kind of keeping quiet about it by calling the constant kappa zero. Okay, and the reason for this is that this problem has some dependence on some spectral considerations, which I want to explain. And so sometimes for some forms, we have been able to prove that this is an optimal result, while for other forms, uh, we just have and the weaker bounds, okay? So that's what I wish to explain in my remaining time. So as I said uh, briefly before, there are three kind of main techniques. Uh, one of them involves some moment formula for something called the Zeker transform, uh, otherwise uh, known as an Eisenstein series or pseudo Eisenstein series. This kind of thing, uh, we developed, uh, Dubi Shucheng and myself, developed this uh, formula for congruence quotients of a special linear group. And this formula has had some other, uh, you know, applications, uh, some of which would interest a probabilist, like we have some Poissonian behavior for the Gauss circle problem. But that's a story for another day. The second method, uh, as I said, involves exponential sums. And uh, here there's a beautiful result of Burgan, where he studies the same problem for homogeneous forms, but averages over a smaller family of uh, ternary forms. And averaging over smaller families, of course, is more difficult than averaging over the whole parameter space. And so uh, recently we have uh, some uh, nice work with uh, Vinay Kumaraswamy, who is a colleague here at the IFR about this uh, in the context of inhomogeneous forms. And the ergodic and spectral methods, uh, you know, uh, my co-authors, Alex Grodnik, Amos Nevo, and I have a series of papers which investigate uh, diaphantan analysis and uh, spectral theory. And in particular, we have a paper on this Oppenheim problem, which deals with many cases of uh, many polynomial uh, inequalities, many problems on varieties. And uh, 
uh, I have some work with Doobie Kilmer, which uh, along similar lines. So there are, these are three main techniques. So in the results that I presented, the first technique was used in the rational shift case. And the last technique was used in the case where the quadratic form is fixed and the shift is allowed to vary. Okay, so I'm running uh, out of time. I want to discuss this spectral method a little bit, but I also wanted to advertise this result of Menez and mine, which I really like. So I'm going to state it quickly. So this is a joint result with uh, Vinay Kumaraswamy of the Tata Institute. And uh, this has to do with inhomogeneous quadratic forms of the following kind. So they're diagonal quadratic forms. And uh, here, what happens is that this is a family of quadratic forms parametrized by this alpha two and alpha three. And what we're doing is we're fixing one parameter. So we're going to average only over alpha three. So it's an average over a much smaller family than in the previous result. And it needs a completely different uh, technique based uh, on exponential sums. And here the uh, statement is assuming a conjecture in number theory called the exponent pair conjecture, uh, kind of uh, along the lines of the Lindelof hypothesis. We have a good quantitative uh, effective result for these diagonal quadratic forms. And unconditionally, we have a slightly weaker result. All right, so this is just an advertisement for this result. I won't have anything to say about it today. And I'm going to skip this slide, which is a nice application of this work with Vinay, something which comes up along the way, which has to do with counting points near where I am. So I'm going to go back for the last, uh, 20 minutes or so to this result. So let me state it, and then I want to explain the proof and what we know and what we don't know. So I'm fixing a rational quadratic form Q, it's fixed, and I'm allowing the shift to vary, and I want to solve this system of inequalities. And as I said, I have a range of solutions depending on kappa zero. So kappa zero turns out to be a, a it's explicit, but it's complicated. Okay? So as you can see, there is a table here with signatures and values of kappa zero. So these are some preliminary signatures and values. And more generally, uh, this is a formula for other signatures. And so I want to explain uh, how one would approach this, this particular kind of problem. Um, okay, so Let's start with this fixed uh, rational quadratic form and consider a special orthogonal group or more precisely its connected component. So let G be the connected component, SOQ, connected component of SOQ. And uh, since this quadratic form is rational, the set of integer points gamma is a lattice in G. So it's a discrete subgroup with uh, finite cobalt. So using the natural embedding of G in SLNR, we get a natural action of G on Rn. And so we may consider the semi-direct product uh, of G with Rn and call it G tilde. And it turns out that in fact that uh, the semi-direct product of gamma with Zn called gamma tilde is then a lattice in G tilde. And of course, uh, there is, uh, gives a natural action on the left of the group G on the space uh, G tilde mod gamma tilde, and therefore on the space L2 of G tilde mod gamma tilde. This preserves the hard measure on G tilde mod gamma tilde, which we normalize to be probable. So the theorem is reduced to a so-called shrinking target problem. So some of you might be familiar with Sullivan's logarithm law for geodesics in hyperbolic manifold. So this kind of thing is a similar philosophical issue, but uh, instead of looking at uh, cusp excursions of uh, geodesic flow or one parameter flow, we are trying to examine what happens when um, uh, 
a bigger group acts like a lattice or a group or a subgroup. And try, we're trying to control how it behaves uh, around the smaller and smaller neighborhoods of a point. Okay. So this fact that you can reduce this quadratic forms uh, uh, effectivity problem to a shrinking target problem is due to uh, myself, Rodnick, and Novo. And uh, in a similar, it was also used by myself and with, uh, with in joint work with Kelmer in, in a context similar to Burgan's paper. But let me now set up the main uh, thing that I want to discuss. So <clears throat> this, let's take it for granted. Uh, I won't have time to explain why that is. Let's take it for granted that if I have some nice control over equidistribution property, quantitative equidistribution properties of SOQ acting on the semi-direct product, the quotient of the semi-direct product, if I know this, if I have some quantitative information about this, then I can effectively solve the inhomogeneous quadratic form problem. Let's take this for granted for today. I want to now discuss how to quantitatively study the G action on G tilde or gamma tilde. So one way is to use uh, the mean ergodic theorem. And so uh, what one does is one takes a function f in uh, L2 of this homogeneous space, and you take a sequence of growing measurable sets in G and average over them. So consider the averaging operator, <clears throat> which averages over this, uh, say this ball, GT. And uh, you, know, you should think of this average as uh, an analog of the time average in Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, but in a more general context. Okay, and so the question is, how uh, can you uh, give good bounds on the operator norm of this uh, object over here? So here's a theorem uh, due to uh, Kelmer, you, and myself, and it says, uh, let Q be an uh, indefinite rational form of some signature. Then there is a family of growing norm balls with measures bounded below by this expression, such that for any kappa less than kappa one which is explicit, and any function in L two zero, so since zero zero just uh, refers to functions which integrate out to zero on the torus, we have the following sharp bound on these averaging operators. The L2 norm of these averaging operators is bounded above by the L2 norm of the function divided by the measure of the growing subset raised to the power of kappa. And the implied constant depends on the kappa. Okay, so this theorem directly, not directly, but through some dictionary. So there's a dictionary which goes from homogeneous spaces to quadratic forms and back. So this theorem, you feed it into the dictionary and out of the other side will come the quadratic forms theorem, okay? So then the question is how to prove a theorem such as this. And especially since we're interested in sharp results, how to uh, get as good uh, uh, exponent kappa here as possible. Okay, so uh, there's a general uh, spectral transfer principle due to Nevo, according to which uh, this, this exponent here can be interpreted in terms of the strong spectral gap of the corresponding representation, namely that of G on L200 of the affine quotient. And so one has to obtain effective bounds for strong spectral gap for this action, which in many uh, number theoretic, geometric and dynamical situations is a natural problem. This strong spectral gap is controlled by a parameter called P of pi. And uh, this is defined uh, very easily. It's, you consider a unitary representation of 
a semi-simple Lie group on a Hilbert space, and call it strongly LP if the matrix coefficients are in LP for a dense set of vectors. And the smallest such P, the infimum of all such P <coughs> is uh, in fact the parameter P of pi. Okay, so we started with a quadratic form problem, fed it into a dictionary, out came a quantitative equidistribution problem for which we are able to prove a theorem by, by proving sharp bounds for the operator norm of these, uh, for this operator. And this sharp bound depends on computing uh, a certain spectral gap, which is controlled by this parameter P. So the main issue now is how to compute this parameter P. And in the last uh, remaining minutes, I would like to discuss how to do it. Um, so, uh, Anish, uh, so the, yes. the group G here, uh, I think I missed something. This Does this have P, uh, property T by any chance? No? No, that's just the uh, next slide. Okay, right. Yeah, it's coming up. It's, it's a very good point. It's just, uh, in fact, the next bullet point. Amanda <laughs> is always one step ahead. So, as uh, Manu was saying, when G has Karstadt's property T, in fact, there is a uniform bound such that P of pi is less than or equal to P of G for all unitary representations of G. Okay, so there is a uniform bound. Okay, that's good news. Um, let's see. There is a work of uh, Wang from 2014, which says that if you take a, a group G acting linearly, on, linearly in RN with no non-trivial fixed points, then you can find a, a number, call it P of G tilde, such that P of pi is at most P of G tilde for any representation pi, which is a restriction of representation of g tilde to g, and this representation pi tilde has no RN invariant vector. Okay. So now the situation is as follows. So we have a very specific situation. So we have a lattice gamma, which could be the integer points of orthogonal group or a subgroup thereof. We consider the representation pi gamma tilde of G on L2 of G tilde mod gamma tilde, which integrate out to zero on the torus. And so for this representation, we set pi of gamma tilde to be equal to P of pi of the representation, okay? This is a restriction of representation of G tilde with no non-trivial RN invariant vectors. So we have a hierarchy that P of G, which is provided to us when G has Cartesian property T, is at least P of G tilde, is at least P of gamma tilde. Okay? And so our, our game in this uh, business, see the point is that in many situations, we, we will have a bound, but we want the best bound. And so uh, what we have to do is try to make do not with necessarily with bounds on PG, but with bounds on P of gamma tilde and P of G tilde. And these bounds are not, uh, they seem to not have been so many people computing them. And it's, it's still kind of illusive. So there are many good values of P of G. Uh, for example, when G is property T, uh, Li and uh, O, separately give uh, often sharp bounds on these Kajdan constants. But regarding these other two uh, parameters, uh, which arise in a specific situation, see, the, uh, you know, since we have a specific representation, we might want to try to leverage it to get better bounds. That is our hope. So we may not necessarily want the Kajdan bound. So much less is known regarding these values. There are some results. So Kajdan's original paper on Kajdan's property has this beautiful result that when Q has signature 2, 1, uh, any representation of the seven-direct product of 
uh, S of Q with R3, with no non-trivial R3 invariant vectors is tempered. So this implies that in with Q, with, when Q is signature to one, this uh, exponent that we're interested in, P of G tilde is exactly equal to two. So uh, in her paper, Van produces explicit bounds for P of G tilde in a very general context, but actually in many cases, they're even worse than the Kajitan bounds. So we have taken, we started with a quadratic form problem, and now we're in a situation where we have to give sharp bounds for uh, temperedness of certain specific representations of uh, semi-simple groups. So in uh, our work with uh, Kelmer and Yu, we make some progress to this. So we establish some lower bounds for this uh, uh, integrability of this representation uh, for uh, SOQR and show that in fact, uh, in most cases, these representations with a few, with five exceptions, with four exceptions and one possible exception, these representations are never tempered. So that's one result. This is the result, it's a bit technical, but since I set it out, I'll skip this side. This result says that with the possible exception of these three signatures, with the exception of these three signatures, and this one, which you're not sure of, no other representation which arises like this is tempered. And for upper bounds, uh, we can only do uh, two kinds of upper bounds. We could prove uh, that uh, for quadratic forms of signature 2, 2, the associated representation is tempered. And we could also compute upper bounds for uh, SON minus 1, 1, essentially using uh, induction from the base case of 2, 1, and then uh, uh, this uh, so-called Mackey machine and uh, this work of uh, result of Berger and Sarma. And so uh, I think I'm almost out of time. So let me uh, basically conclude, let's skip the last few slides. And uh, so there's something about, uh, you know, Selva Gramarajan, but maybe I'll skip it. But let me say that, uh, uh, this problem of effectivity for inhomogeneous quadratic forms seems to be intimately connected to uh, part of uh, quantum chaos. It's very interesting in its own right, and it seems to be extremely complicated. Um, this work with Kelmer and Neil, which was the main topic of discussion today, we were able to produce uh, a substantial number of positive results. And the, the most interesting part of it was this computation of the spectral parameter. And uh, essentially, what we seem to be showing is that uh, there's a deep connection between the arithmetic of quadratic forms and the spectrum of the associated representation. But it remains to be seen whether uh, the failure of temperedness in the representation necessarily affects the quality of the arithmetic. So, or is it simply that one can use a completely different approach for the cases where we don't get optimal experiment? So this is uh, one of these uh, intriguing open questions. I leave you with this and stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks Anish for the wonderful talk. Let us all thank uh, for speaker. Uh, we can we have time to take three questions, so go ahead. Uh, Anish, I had a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, here you're working with inhomogeneous uh, and quadratic form. So what yes. would happen if uh, one tries to projectivize this and then look at them as a quadratic form in n plus one variables? For example, I mean, you had used the example of uh, m plus alpha uh, and uh, plus m plus alpha whole square plus uh, n plus uh, beta whole square, right? So I could homogenize this by saying, uh, I mean, if I'm uh, saying uh, 
n plus uh, alpha let's say x whole square plus n plus uh, beta uh, x whole square this would still stay a quadratic equation and uh, i mean one can then talk about the values at the specific point when we are evaluating it at uh, x equals to 1 that would amount to the same problem uh, of inhomogeneous uh, quadratic forms right yes yes that's right yeah so uh, as far as i can tell it uh, makes no difference okay thanks Hi, I'm Sen Gupta. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Hi. Yeah, yeah, I missed, I got disconnected, so I missed the temple. Were you describing the decomposition of that representation of G on L2, G tilde mod gamma tilde? Yeah, no, I didn't discuss it, but it comes into the, of course, it comes into play. So the, the, it has irreducible sub-representations? Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah. I see. And you are saying that uh, many tempered representations occur there. I just missed the statement because I got disconnected. Ah, no, no. So, uh, yeah, basically, I was saying that. Uh, so, we have this. Uh, uh, so, we started with some uh, quadratic form uh, problem and then we converted it uh, into a problem about uh, uh, quantitative equidistribution of uh, the G action on L2 G mod gamma. Yeah, and this uh, somehow the, the the rate of uh, equidistribution of this action is governed by the uh, essentially the uh, rate of uh, decay or matrix coefficients of the representation of G on L two of the semi direct product of the uh, quotient of the semi direct product. Okay, okay. And so one uh, wants to compute uh, the optimal rate of uh, decay of this uh, of representation of matrix coefficients for the representation of G acting on L2 of the affine quotient. And so then uh, essentially it turns into a case by case situation. So sometimes if you have um, property T, you get some bounds for free. If you're working uh, in a situation where there are a lot of SL2s and you have an explicit description of the unitary dual which you can bring into play, that is also used. Whatever uh, tools we have available all come in in trying to get good bounds for this um, exponent. So that's somehow the message. Yeah, so that strongly LP condition you put. Yes that so any tempered representation is an l2 plus epsilon for any epsilon that's right, that's right that's why you want to look at them because they'll automatically be strongly lp yeah yeah so somehow uh, so somehow it seems that <clears throat> uh, the best solution for the quadratic form problem seems to correspond to uh, tempered situations but unfortunately, uh, as we are able to show here, for many signatures, the representation is not tempered. So therefore, we are unable to get the optimal bounds. We get good bounds. Now, it's not clear whether um, this is a fundamental thing or not. But in many other cases, we are able to prove temperedness, which gives the optimal I see. OK, thank you. Okay, so if uh, there are no further questions, so let us thank our speaker again. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you all. Hope, hope to see you next week.